Hey, Jason Rice with Lot Party here. This is our 10th episode, and I want to kind of give you an introduction again what Lot Party is all about. If you ever worked on a dealership lot, you know what it means. You get all the salespeople, the porters together, and start moving around that physical lot to get them to stand tall. What we're doing here in Lot Party Show, though, is talking about your virtual lot or pretty much anything, what we can do to help move those cars off your lot, both new and used. And this being our 10th episode, I'm excited about it. we got good content. But, man, check out our other nine uh, shows. We've done things from new car strategies, uh, interviewing a dealer that does a great job there. We've done small town dealers. We've done luxury dealers doing velocity turn. We've entered, uh, talked to rapid recon turnaround time and the benefits of, of slimming down that turnaround time to actually interviewing a, use, a service director that actually is hands-on and has a four-day turnaround time. Um, I've talked to independent dealers. We've got some good content. My last week, episode nine, is huge content. I talk about what really drives SRPs because I've asked at several webinars, several conferences, several dealers that I talk to, um, no one really seems to understand what really drives SRPs and BDPs, uh, but mostly we dig into SRPs. You need to get those to go. So check out episode nine. Today on episode 10, I'm actually going to be interviewing Ben Pridemore. He's the general sales manager of Carl's Buick. I met Ben um, probably close to eight years ago, and they were he was at a Chevy store in Florida that was selling about 30, 40 cars, carrying about 70 or 80, and I was with Viato at the time, and we helped that store be able to crank that up to selling 70, 80 cars, carrying 70 cars, and then over 100. Now he's at um, Carl's Buick, and they're doing the same thing. Right now, his current average day in inventory is 19 days, carrying 113 cars. Of the 113 cars, only eight of them are over 46 days old. We're going to dig into that with him uh, in this interview, but I want to I want to dig into his brain and get you guys some best practices of how he accomplishes things like that. What what does he focus on? What does he look at? And what is he what is the daily routine to get those type of numbers done? Because he's done it for years. He's one of the best used car managers I've seen out there. So I hope you enjoy this interview. And at the end, we'll have a quick little tip for you also. Again, enjoy this 10th episode. Thanks. Hey, Jason Rice here, and I'm going to be doing this interview with Ben Pridemore. He doesn't have a camera, but we're going to have him on voice. Hey, Ben, you there? Hey, Jason. How are you? Excellent, man. So, Ben, I, I described in the intro before our, meet, or our interview here, um, you're, at, you're the general sales manager at Carl's Buick GMC, correct? Correct. Now, give me a little bit of a background. How long have you been in the industry, and um, you know, when did you, how did you start in the car business? Sure, Jason. My dad was always in the car business, and um, I started with him washing cars during the summer when I was 12 years old. So it's something I've kind of always done and um, sold my first car when I was 15 and lied and uh, told the customers I was 18 when they thought I was too <laughs> young and kind of been in it. Just um, all my life, I've worked at uh, two dealerships other than my dad's, and one was a um, Chevrolet store for uh, seven years, and I've been here at this Buick GMC store in Florida for uh, four years now. All right. So your dad was at a little, was it a franchise or a mom and pop store, or how? what was that? No, it, it was as mom and pop as it gets, and um, it was a ton of fun, so it was definitely uh, it was definitely. A little bit new when I got all the structure of a franchise store, and it uh, grew me up fast, and I learned a lot in a hurry. Do you? Um, it, how long did that dealership last? How long did your dad do it, is, and, and been involved in the car business? Well, when I um, I started with uh, the Chevrolet store for seven years, I started as a salesperson, then went to uh, F and I, and then uh, to new cars, and then finally back down to used, which is kind of where I always thought was. Uh, my home or you know what I knew the most about yeah and um, that was when um, Viato was just rolling into the market so um, what I thought I knew so well Viato <laughs> kind of made me have one heck of a paradigm shift and kind of crushed my world and made me realize I knew nothing at all so um, it kind of broke me and uh, started molding me um, into you know doing what we do now. And, and when that's I, I was thinking about it last night um, preparing for this meeting and just kind of, you know, what are we going to talk about? And I started thinking, man, has it been about eight years since we've known each other? Because I've been doing my lot pop for about two and a half years, and I was with Viato for eight and a half years, so that's 11 years. And you were probably a few years, I mean, I came to your store a few years into that experience. So how long would, would you say it's been? It's been close to eight years? Uh, it's been every bit of eight or ten years. Uh -huh. I remember... Uh... 
when uh, Dale came down and had a meeting with our uh, with our group used car managers and our general manager, which there was five stores in the group, and uh, you know it was uh, there was, it was it it took a lot of the old car guy, which kind of the way my dad had taught me and the way others around had taught me, and it's like wow, you know there really is a better, smarter way to do this thing, and um, you know I think any success that I uh, have right now is really based on just um, you know, looking at it in a completely different light, you know, yeah. looking at a car as a, a commodity, that's what it is, you know, not as that uh, beautiful, pristine, <laughs> you know, white diamond uh, Cadillac with single-digit miles, yeah. you know, it's truly a commodity, and that's what's really helped us now, especially with our turn rate. Yeah, and at the beginning here, I did a little intro before our, our talk here, about five minutes or so, and I talked about uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, I try to remember going into your Chevy store, you guys were carrying about 70, 80 units, selling about 30 or 40, and I remember being able to, you know, you get that thing up to 70, 80, carrying 70, 80, and then we you grew it to 100 and 120, and then start, you start selling 100 cars. Is that, am I remember that correctly? That, I think that level. You're, you're exactly right, because I kind of came from the school of thought before Beato that, you need a 60-day supply, so if you wanted to sell, and you know it even sounds asinine to repeat it right now, but if you wanted <laughs> to sell 100 cars, you needed 200 on the ground, and that was yeah. the only way that deal would ever work. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, wow, wow was that way of thinking uh, flawed. Yeah, yeah. And that's the thing, because, again, I remember some of those conversations, and, and, you know, having going from 30 or 40 carrying 70 or 80 to that 70 or 80, you know, any dealer that gets to that level, um, you know, sometimes they jump in it too fast and, and hey, if I, let's go buy another 20, another 20, we can keep selling. But I, I think it's better to pace it out, carry that 70, sell 70, carry that 70 month in and month out. So about three months, once you get that level, then maybe add another 10 cars and then maybe and then do that for another month or two, then add another 10. Because I think it's the back end stuff like the service turnaround photos and all that stuff that has got to be streaming. Um, I guess if you can compliment on or comment on that, is that kind of what got you to these levels too? Is being a little bit more patient, not jumping all in at once? Well, I was very fortunate that that um, when I did work for the group, I, I worked for and saw a lot of used car managers with a lot of different philosophies. And and the boss that we worked for was he was very giving in the fact that it you know he'd let you he'd let you have enough rope to hang yourself. And I watched a lot of guys that uh, would, were carrying thirty cars on the ground. And they sell. 35 next month well the following month they're going to want to carry 70 yeah. and you just can't double your inventory in 30 days because your processes your people nobody's used to it and you're not going to have any level of success and it seems like what it does is it just eats upon itself so then you get back to selling 35 then you have an aging problem and then you get disgruntled with the whole situation and i watched that happen to four or five used car managers and they get burned out and they end up mm -hmm. quitting or asked to leave and they say v auto doesn't work or they say you know the philosophy doesn't work and um it was really really eye-opening to me just to um you know i'm a terribly impatient person by nature <laughs> but to know that the most sustained growth is very very slow and controlled growth yeah yeah and that's you know again watching that that inventory and that sales level grow it was phenomenal and you know, again, now I looked at your inventory today and I think you're carrying about 113 units. Average day is 19, which is actually, sometimes it's a little bit high for you, but it's it's pretty consistent. I think the highest I've seen it run in the in the mid-20s, but that's when you had 130 units, not 113. And right now I think you only have eight cars of the 113 over 46 days old. So what do you guys do maybe internally, um, some of the turnaround time or, or things that, is it pricing? I mean, what what allows you to get to that kind of level and again that's consistency i'm going to have a I'll, I'll point the chart here if i didn't already of that average day in inventory you can see it's pretty consistent over the last three months it's in the 20s and now and sometimes in the teens what would you say is that key that keeps you there is it is it pricing is it turnaround time is it all the above that that helps you maintain well I, I i would i would tell you that um there's no silver bullet to it but what does seem to make the biggest difference is the quicker you can get the picture online, the quicker you can get the comment online, and the quicker you can get the car picked up from the auction and through reconditioning, the better result you'll have. So what it almost turns you into is where, you know, you might be satisfied 
paying uh, 400 a car out of Dallas, Texas. Well, if you can get it four days faster, you might have to pay 550 So it really turns you into a, kind of like a turn Nazi. All you want to <laughs> do is get the car here. If you got to pay a little extra or if you got to buy just a little bit nicer car just because it doesn't need the front and back bumper painted or it doesn't need tires, you yeah. do what you have to do to get the right car in order to get it on the lot three to six days faster than all your competition. And I think a lot of else is the pricing. And if you price it competitively like any commodity, it's going to be forced to sell in an open market. Yeah. So we pay very close attention to our cost to market because our price to market does, is going to be consistently one of the lowest in our region because that's what helps make us turn our numbers. And speaking of competition, and again, knowing that market, you're in Stewart, Florida, small Florida town, but so competitive, um, again, knowing, being involved in that market for eight to ten years now, watching your store and stuff, and I know you have off-lease only, which is how far away from you, would you say? They've got uh, They've got four locations surrounding us now with the closest, um, or the the closest being 35 miles away. And they have how many cars with the four? They have, uh, the, at, the 35, at the 35 mile location, they keep around 800 to 1,000 in stock. And um, through the four, they have 4,000 to 4,500. And I know watching that market, you have to price pretty much low 90s, high 80s out the gate because that's where these guys are that carry 1,000 cars that's off lease only. And to give some people an idea how big this off lease only is, I, if you fly, if you get in a Southwest Airlines flight and you pick up the Southwest Airlines magazine, they've got a full page ad in there talking about that, you know, here's SUVs, 500 in stock, you know, cars. 300 in stock they got a full page ad in the southwest magazines and the airline so they're not going after the local business they're going over some national business there so it's very competitive in your market so you got to be strong out the gate with your pricing right well that's a hundred percent because what we um you know we play with it a lot of different ways because of course at the end of the day we don't care uh, if we sell a hundred used cars, if we're only making a hundred a copy, I mean that's um, you know it doesn't it doesn't make any difference to anybody. We realize you know we do have to make gross on what we sell, but you can't price it a hundred percent, or you will turn into having one heck of an agent problem because nothing will move. Yeah. So like you said, if you don't price in the high eighties, and that's why we try to be so darn good and spend so much time making our acquisitions and trying to buy our vehicles and trying to always get them from alternative sources other than the brick and mortar auctions. Yeah. And, you know, again, I think your price on average probably below 90%, but to be fair, you know, you don't, and not to scare dealers off because a lot of dealers are, oh, I'm not going to take no hundred dollar deals. You, you typically average a, a grand to 1200 average markup and don't really negotiate off of that price. So, I mean, would you say that's fair that, you know, even at that turn level and at that aggressive price, you could still on some months be running a grand to 1200 a copy? Yeah, on our front end, we average, uh, not including our 549.50 dealer fee, we run in anywhere between 11 to 1300 a copy on the yeah. front side, and um, we have an average recon of around 700, and we have a 550 dealer fee. So it makes the whole dealership healthy. Yeah. When we can sell, like last month, we sold 127 pre-owned, <laughs> and I think that uh, you know a lot of the guys they get scared off, but. You know, three quarters of the people that come in and buy a car have got a trade in, and what's the easiest way to make money? It's to make it, make money off their customers' money. Yeah, yeah. So you might you might have something advertised for a hundred dollars markup, but if you can figure out a way to hold a thousand or fifteen hundred on a trade, you can help get you home. Yeah. So you know, a, cust a customer's not going to pay up just because you paid up across the block. They don't give a darn if you've got too much <laughs> in the car. And it seems like that was one of the toughest things to wrap my head around early on. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I just uh, I did a post about it, the hope and change. I, talk, I, I jokingly talk about the Obama strategy that, yeah, some guys go to the auction, pay too much for a car, and then they price it up hoping that somebody will pay too much for it or that the market changes and their car <laughs> becomes more valuable. And, and it's a funny post, but, it, I mean, it's true, and I run into it just so, much, so often. But if you guys that's watching the show just heard him, he, does, he did over 120-something units last month, carrying 113 right now, and he averaged over 1,200, 1,300 a copy. There is, and I always 
push this out there to dealers. There is such a thing as that holy grail of gross and volume. So many people think you have to give up one over the other. And oh, if I go for volume, I'm giving up my gross. If I go for gross, I've I'm, I'm got age and I deal with my volume. But there is, if you can get disciplined enough to turn this inventory, manage it efficiently like Ben's talking about here, you, you can have both gross and volume. And, and, and Ben's a great example of that. Well, I think we can all agree, uh, you know, in which I've never had a pay, I've never had a pay plan based on volume, and I think most of us out there are in that same boat. So yeah, yeah. we we got to do what we got to do. Yeah. Now you, we always and and you know we dial in the numbers, and I know you get real analytical sometimes, but you always watch yourself not to get too analytical. I remember having one conversation with you a few years back. I think we we're talking about an HHR, and it stuck out in my head because. Um, I don't know if I said maybe you're pricing it too cheap or why are you so aggressive out the gate. It was probably like 85 or 88 percent. And you said, well, I, I've, I've watched these enough because they're kind of at the rental rocket level at that point in time. There's just a ton of them out there. You said, if I mark it up over 800 bucks, the thing sets. If I mark it up 500, the thing sells. So you really start digging into, you know, the cause and effect of what's really going on in your lot in marketing. But you also make sure you don't overanalyze the data, too. Right. What's your quote that you always say? Exactly. You don't want to. You don't want to get analysis paralysis by go. no means. Because at the end of the day, this is it's really a pretty simple thing we do. And um, like a, like an old timer that I learned the world from taught me, he says you got to recognize the cars that it's okay to make five hundred on, and you got to recognize the cars that you need to make five grand on. Yeah, yeah. So as, as as long as you can recognize those two facts, you know that there's not a whole lot of use. You know, spending a whole heck of a lot of time digging because if you're not careful, you'll end up in uh, in analysis paralysis. Now, you're the general sales manager at the store, correct? Correct. Now, do you do, you, you're pricing all the use, right? Correct. Do you desk all the deals and or who appraises? Is it just you or is it open floor as far as you got three other managers appraising? How does that process work out? Like, again, going back to to get this turn going good, you got to know what you're buying, how you're buying it. One is the biggest impact you can make is at the store. You can't control what other people will in that lane to step up on, but you can't control what you do at your store. So what's the appraisal process? How many managers touch those cars and who, who overlooks that? We, we have a... Uh two appraising managers with myself being one. So we, we've got two appraisers and, um, you know, now that, you know, I've worked with the other manager for the last four years, mm -hmm. we, um, you know, our, our, our thinking is fair, scary parallel. You know, on um, there's some cars that, Jason, we take in on a new car trade to make the deal, and it's the nicest, prettiest, daggone uh, 2013 Toyota Sequoia Pearl White with low mm -hmm. miles that we don't even try on the used car lot because Viato says it's not going to work and we know that we're not going to get a premium for that car. We take it to the auction and, and get out of it and it brings what we put in it. So what we always try to remember is the wholesale market and the retail market by no means run parallel. Yeah. So if you always are appraising off of you're going to retail that car, you're going to miss deals. Mm -hmm. But if you always keep an open mind and realize some cars you're going to have to ship right to the auction and you're going to have to, you know, and get out of them at the auction because we've all had that car that you price on your lot and you, you price it at dead cost for a month and then you take it to the auction and it brings 1500 more. Well, yeah. why wouldn't you have just took that car to the auction as soon as you got it and worried about putting more cars on the lot that you can actually make money with? Yeah, yeah. And that's a good point. So now, now with that inventory coming in, you got to also, you know, offset it with some auction cars because you're giving up some, you got to go, you know, make it up. With your auction purchases, what percentage of those cars are you actually bidding at the lane versus doing online? Uh, we don't go to any auctions. All right, so everything's online. Every, everything's online, and um, here in about the last uh, 60 days, we're trying to really limit our um, lenience, our, our reliance on uh, simulcast because the fees have gotten so high. And we get the majority of all of our cars through either OVE, open lane, or smart auction because they have controlled smaller fees. Okay. And then with OVE I'd say 90%. Auction. What's that, 90%? Yes. Through those sources. And OVE, with OVE and smart auction, I think buyers are getting a little bit more comfortable buying online. But running into that so often is a lot of buyers just don't feel comfortable without touching and feeling the car, you know, and, 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 but being able to buy online, spread your wings, allows you to be able to be bidding on more cars. And then again, stumble across some good deals out there 
uh, because you're 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 spreading yourself you're spreading yourself out instead of being thin at the lane and, and that's all you're doing. So, um, well, let's face it. I mean, one used car manager couldn't do all he needed to do, you know, and and, and leave his desk and go to the auction. You know, kind of like here where we're at in Stewart. Mm-hmm. You know, in the state of Florida, there's there's an auction just about every day and every night a car auction somewhere in the state. Yeah. But you know, you, you end up losing a day. And buying's important, but I think selling's just a little bit more important. And, you know, we've got to wrap this up here. we only got a couple minutes left, Ben. But, you know, you're one of the best used car managers. You know, again, I've ran into a decade worth of, well, 12 years worth of used car managers being in thousands of stores. And you're definitely one of the tops I run into. And you guys do a phenomenal job there at that store. If there's one thing to wrap up here with real quick, uh, you know, to get a dealer to understand that you can get volume and gross and and turnaround time but you know we threw a lot out there what would be that one thing that you would say that they need to actually do today that make i would say i would tell you one thing that uh you know especially this time of year i always hear from a a lot of my friends and and fellow used car managers in the business is you know why would i take that 60 70 car day old car to the auction when i'm just going to buy the same one back at the auction and i'm going to pay more for it and the toughest thing, and, and I know it was tough because it was tough for me to get through my head, is, is you know what, just because you're going to pay more doesn't matter. Those salespeople have been walking around with that customer that's been on your website looking for the perfect car for the last 60 days has been walking around that car. And you just got to realize when merchandise is dead. And if you, usually if you don't sell it in the first 30 days, it's dead. If you don't sell it in the first 60, you don't have a shot. And you definitely don't have a shot at making any money. And I would say that that's probably the biggest thing that if I could sure. ever give anybody any advice that was tough for me to realize is you got to realize when to cut <laughs> bait and move on. I just had that conversation today with the dealer and I run it a lot of times. I ask, hey, what's going on with the car? Oh, I just wholesaled it. What'd you wholesale it for? 20 grand. And the last price I had was 22. You know, it's like, we'll drop it down. But, you know, we're running out of time here, Ben. Thanks for your time. And again, it was an awesome interview and I uh, hope you guys enjoyed it and we'll catch you next week on Lot Party. Thanks. All right, that was a great interview with Ben Pridemore, GSM of Carl's Buick GMC. As you can tell, I mean, this guy is sharp. He knows his inventory. He knows how to turn it. And, again, that's just the biggest, like what he said at the end is, you know, know what car, and even at the, in the middle of it where he's talking about appraising a car, knowing that you're already too much into it, just dump it right away. But, two, when you get that aged car, you know, don't sit and complain and say, well, if I got to, if I sell it for that, you know, I got to go back to the auction and pay more for it. You always want to be a buyer. You know, you always want to be thin and, and lean and clean in that inventory so you can be a buyer. If the wholesale market goes up, doesn't necessarily mean the retail market goes up because, you know, just because I pay up at the lane right now, there's guys that I'm going to be putting that car in the inventory. There's dealerships that are have aged ones that are going to be pricing them cheap. So, you know, knowing when to dump a car if the wholesale auction or the wholesale buyers are going up, dump that car right away, get off of it, don't sit on it and try to hope that you can get out of it. And then at that age car, just go ahead and I don't want to wholesale anything. Uh, I know he retails out of a majority of his cars. Always want to retail out of everything. So to go back to his point about just just go ahead and sell it, even if it's cheaper than what you got to buy at the lane. I tell my dealerships, again, as I wrapped up with him, well, I'll, I'll talk to dealer and they say, oh, I just wholesaled it for 18 grand and their last asking price was 20. And I'm thinking, why wouldn't you have dropped it to 19 grand? Why wouldn't you have dropped it to 18 before you do it? Well, shoot, even drop it to 17.5 because by the time you transportation and fees, and even if you didn't pay transportation and fees, which you will, you, you didn't get a shot at a trade. You didn't get a shot at the F&I to make up that difference. Just get off of these cars. They're depreciating asset and you want to turn that inventory. So Ben makes some great points there. Uh, also, again, when he talked about wholesale and retail, don't run on the same. It, it, you, when you think about it, wholesale is a totally different market than retail. Wholesale is a global market. There's people in other countries coming in and buying cars and shipping them back. It's a global market. A guy in California could be bidding on cars in New York if they really wanted to, and they can. So it's a global market. But when we look at retail, it's local market and regional at best. You might be able to pull somebody two or three states away. I've sold people. I sold I sold cars in St. Louis, sold some lady in Alaska. It's thin. It's very thin pickings, but it happens, but it's not the majority. Go back to the 
80-20 rule. On the, on the retail end, it's a regional or local market. So just because somebody's willing to pay that much at the lane, they could be shipping that to a whole different market where that card becomes more valuable. And I've ran into this at a couple of dealerships meetings I've been having lately. Dealers are looking at the books and stuff and not looking at retail market. And they're putting book money in it. They, they actually own it good. NADA book trade, what he was looking at was 17.2. But when we looked at it in the retail market, the average retail market was 17.2. So when you're appraising these cars, either at the curb or at the lane, you need to look at that retail market like Ben was talking about. And if it's at the curb and you've got to step up too much that you can't price it to the retail market, dump it wholesale as soon as possible. Or if you're at the lane, don't be buying based off of wholesale values. Be buying off of your local retail market a bit it that way and to be willing to walk away if you don't but realize what ben was saying too 100 percent of his cars online he's not standing at the lane wasting time he's online bidding cars all over the country and bring them into his dealership so again i'm going to wrap this up with my video that I was talking about the obama hope and change i did a little video tip at the uh last week i'm going to add it to the end of this video here so i hope you enjoy it see us next week on episode 11 i appreciate your time i appreciate your attendance thanks bye hey jason rice with pop pop and i want to give you a quick inventory tip and i see this way too often in dealerships and what i call it is the obama hope and change strategy on used car inventory and what i mean by that is a lot of times we've got a new car deal used car deal and we're dealing with a trade-in and we'll end up stepping up on that trade or we buy a car at the auction we step up on that maybe needs more recon than we anticipated so we end up owning that car for way more than we anticipate then by the time we recon it and get it through our service department we own that car to where it's very hard to price it to market average so sometimes a lot of dealerships will again put that obama strategy and price that car up in hopes that somebody might end up paying us too much for that car or that the, actually the market might change and our car becomes more valuable so again the the obama hope and change strategy sometimes is, it is not going to be the best strategy on these type of inventory the cars that you step up on and the cars that you're buried in are cars that you know are going to be problems more than likely all the way to the end and those cars that aged on your lot i bet you can point back from the very beginning and knew it was going to be an issue from day one so the tip is just price those cars to the market price those cars competitively even just to get off them as soon as possible even if it means it's a 200 dollars 10 day old deal or if it's a $200 loser being 10 days old just price that car get off of it as soon as possible and don't go for that hope and change because again it will just lead to age you do that strategy it'll help increase your turn which ultimately will increase your overall grocery dealership thanks